Okay, so first up we have Dr. Gieren van Seil. Gieren holds a PhD in plant pathology from Salamos University. Currently is working as a technical consultant for ProCrop and basically provides guidance on integrated pest and disease management, market access requirements, monitoring, and the use of disease prediction models, which he'll tell you all about in his talk, which is entitled Best Practice IPM Strategy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I let for my other path of Um I have to give a, I have 15 to 20 minutes to give you a very oversimplified uh, introduction or approach to a very complex topic, which is IPM or Integrated Disease Management. I would like to start off by just talking about what it is not. What is IPM not? It is not a method for reducing pesticide use. But through the implementation of integrated pest management and this type of approach that you follow, you will more than likely spray less. It's, a, it's a, quite a cool spin-off that you get from good integrated pest management. It is not an acronym for integrated pesticide management. Um, definitely not. Uh, it is currently still today probably the primary system that we usually fall back on in perm and stone fruit production, and there's reasons for that. Um, which we will get to. Um, it is also not one specific practice uh, where we only focus on one strategy and exclude all the other. The idea of IPM is to integrate all the cultural, mechanical, biological, and chemical methods that we can, specifically based on the ecosystem that we're applying it to, in a cost-effective manner that is safe to the operators that needs to implement these strategies and to the health of our food and the environment. And there's a, a great picture that I got of um, one of the IPM sites, IPM centers, uh, which we usually get our information from, in terms of how it's done through identifying and monitoring a specific pest and then evaluating it and then trying to prevent it and then taking action. It's, it's a very complicated picture and it's not always in the, in the way that it happens. Our biggest issue in production today is this. We have created over time these pockets of monoculture perennial crop agro ecosystems, which is mainly managed through fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides. And this does not create an environment that is conducive to IPM, where we can create areas where we can help beneficials to stay and procreate and kill other insects that we want them to kill. And uh, that is kind of contradicting because we need IPM to get good management throughout the system, specifically if we look at the cost factors these days for farming, when it, and especially when it comes to um, fertilizers and specifically crop protection. So these monoculture agroecosystems is where I want to start and this is the issue that we have. I don't want to fall back always to a nice talk about IPM. I want to identify the issue that we have and it is this. We have area-wide large crop monocultures of the same thing over and over and over and over again. And this creates low and poor biodiversity varying from area and also in terms of how deep you go into the agro-ecosystem. We've got these large agro-ecosystems in areas, then we've got the farm, and then we've got the orchards, and they're all differing. The larger these areas, the lower the biodiversity, depending on how you're managing it, and this creates abundant shelter and food sources for pest populations to just develop over time, and this is why we have pests. We create a McDonald's for them to come to. So this low diversity, that we have also leads to unstable open ecosystems that we regularly have to get back in and intervene through inputs to get control. And I am definitely, definitely, definitely skuldig by doing that. I have been in that situation where I can't get anything under control and then I just start spraying and spraying and spraying. And this, at the end, leads to a lag or late colonization of establishment of beneficials and also the beneficials that I'm trying to add they don't establish because the environment is just not conducive. And this puts us in that, this loophole, this bad loophole, where ultimately the environment isn't conducive for to integrate all the factors, 
and this leads to us not abiding by the definition of integrated management. And that's why I want to move away from, from the, the specific, what does IPM mean? And in, so in 1998, I found this paper about three or four years ago. Um, I listened to a talk on YouTube specifically for pollinator-friendly environments, specifically in orchards, and they cited this paper by Marcus Kogan, which um, did a deep dive into the historical perspectives and on continuity developments of IPM. And he actually uh, saw the issue in terms of monocultures, that this is um, the issue, why we can't always lacquer, mix all the implementation or the systems that we have, and said, but listen, let's just change the meaning of IPM to a much more simpler and better system, and it works. He said that IPM should rather be a decision support system for the selection and use of pest control tactics singly or harmoniously coordinated in a management strategy based on a cost-benefit analysis that take into account the interest of impacts on producer society and environment. And with the key word being here, a decision support system, in terms of what can I use to get uh, the best results out of an IPM system depending on my agro-ecosystem. So what should an IPM system be? It should be a decision support system. Firstly, the system should be based on, firstly, maintaining and improving profitability. If you guys don't make money, I don't have a job. So that was the first focus that I need to put on, is that I need to make sure that the control systems that I implement is cost effective. Secondly, I need to minimize selection pressure of specifically chemicals that we use, or pesticides that we use, or any other factor that we're implementing. And fourthly, we need to maintain environmental quality through the systems that we implement. So basically, coming out from that, a best strategy for IPM would be to develop a decision support system for your farm based on your specific, specific agroecological system that you're managing in, which would consist out of preventative tactics, which would be all of the factors that are implement to prevent pathogens and pests, good scouting through an effective monitoring system, being able or be, being able to identify specific pests, not sending me photos every five minutes of what is irivarum and what is irivarum and what is irivarum. <laughs> We're not gonna spray for each of them. And after that, specifically trying to manage tactics through implementing my prevention system, monitoring, using that data to decide what am I gonna do, how am I gonna troll it, and to at the end, evaluate was I effective or not. So why is this important? Basically, why is integrating, I'm just gonna quickly stick to this slide, why is integrating important? Because pests uh, are, usually follows an R8 model, specifically that means that they, they die out quickly and they produce a lot of themselves, and that pushes them to adjust quickly to single management tactics. So in the short term, sprays are effective, but what are we gonna do in the long term? We are losing active ingredients at a dramatic rate currently, which is putting a lot of pressure on us, and specifically in terms of what we have in our arsenal, in terms of specifically pesticides. It's difficult for pests to adapt to multiple tactics, so the more tactics I implement, cultural, mechanical, all these factors, that will decrease the selection pressure. And to understand specifically that in an IPM, the core tactic is still gonna be the use of pesticides. But the way I use it is important in terms of market access, resistance that I'm developing, and safety periods. So that the actors that I use in the period that I use them in is not detrimental to beneficials where possible. And at the end, we need to conserve our environmental quality. So Monoculture agroecosystems is a complex ecological problem or a challenge that we need to correct or adapt to. This is where our pest dilemma comes from. Um, in the previous session, we had a great talk about cover crops, and I want to add by that in the, few, in the, in the next few slides. We need to incorporate and maintain elements of natural ecosystems, and this should form the basis of our prevention, prevention tactics. If we want to incorporate specifically elements like biological control, in our IPM strategies. We need to create an environment where these biological control agents can thrive and survive on their own as naturals or those that we introduce into that specific system. So some of the factors that will follow onto that is specifically where we can, we should um, promote pollinator habitats, 
we need to increase our diversity richness, and we had a good dis the, the panel had a good discussion on that. We need to try and introduce native species that can dominate these areas, if and where possible. It's not going to be easy. And which can possibly lead, at the end, to improve natural control. The idea is with natural control that they will still be there. And through that, sustain a diverse IPM strategy. Durable long-term sustainable IPM will be, at the end, dependent on ecological pest management by increasing the soil health through the agroecosystem and specifically through the specific design that we use above ground and below ground. That, at the end of the day, will give us good IPM in implementation, specifically when we're moving into other strategies. This is just a, a, a slide that I'd like to show you guys in terms of work that we have done over the past, it's now almost from 2003, so it's been uh, a lack of long tight, almost 20 years. Um, specifically, what I would like to indicate here is the, 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 the pluses that you can get from composting and mulching. Um, this is a trial that is that's done in Bockfeld's Kloof, specifically a few years back, uh, myself and Becker, um, we did an evaluation specifically in terms of the nematode um, faunal profile, and over 10 years in relation to the control with the, with the implementation of mulch and compost and mulch, there was a definite shift to a more stable soil profile on those specific areas that we've been implementing and just creating a more ecological friendly environment just through compost and mulching. And um, as Hendrik said, um, since I've been there, and that's probably from 2015, I have no recollection that we've ever controlled woolly apple aphid or that it was necessary to control woolly apple aphid on that farm. And this is, uh, this is what I want to leave this slide in terms of preventative strategies should start with creating a a viable agroecosystem that will promote biological control. Secondly, always have a plan. Hindsight is an exact science. Review your pest and pressure through a yearly pest and disease assessment. I do this with my clients yearly. We call it the PDA. They hate it, but they have to do it. What I would like is to know what is going on in each and every orchard in relation to our pests. The idea is here so that we can start grouping orchards into specific groups as, let's say, low, medium, and high risk, so that we can plan what strategy are we going to follow in each of those orchards. And secondly, why are we having issues in those orchards? Why are we having red spider mite issues in a specific orchard? Is it stress? Is it water? Is it, uh, is it all the weed killing that we're doing? What is the issue specifically there? Just through by doing this, you will immediately reduce pesticides because you're not using a blanket approach anymore. You're specifically allocating orchards, and I'm going to follow specific strategies in, in them. Have a management strategy for each of the pests and diseases on your farm. This is important. Before the season starts, you need to know what am I going to do and where. What specific systems am I going to incorporate to get the best out of IPM? We want to reduce the specific pest population density, and I want to reduce those susceptibilities. So I've just quickly put up, for example, a, a banded fruit weevil control strategy. This is not to say that we're going to implement it, but this is kind of the prevention strategy that I'm going to follow. I want you to focus just at the bottom, right over there, where I, where I specifically indicate there that weevil trunk barriers should be used in the medium and high pressure orchards. Orchard skirting should be done early, and bridge control in the tree should be maintained. That's immediately other aspects of control cultural that I'm bringing in in relation to the sprays that we're going to do on the tree, specifically if there is any uh, banded fruit wheel in the tree. Just to show you how effective this is, this is um, data from 2009 and 2010, where we evaluated the damage on three cultivars in relation to the untreated control. Next to that is our stem barriers and skirting, and next to that is our chemical sprays, and the last set of bars is the stem barriers plus the sprays. And just to show you how effective it is just to use barriers, good skirting, good cover crop control specifically, so that you stop the insects from moving up into the tree. And in relation to that, just see how ineffective the sprays are. And the reason for that is it's hard targets to reach in terms of application. It's very difficult to get control through sprays in the tree. So we need to combine all those factors. 
The second thing that, or the third thing that we need to know is we need to know our pests. We need to know how to correctly ID pests. So you need on your farm enough well-trained personnel that can identify your pests and is well at scouting. We've got great facilities in, in, in the Western Cape that teach um, monitoring courses, specifically at the Co Bockefeld Opleiding Centrum. They give a great monitoring course for, for in, 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 in fruit production, which is very important if you want to roll out effective um, uh, uh, monitors on your farm. Don't do it yourself. Get monitors that's well trained so they can do it. And very importantly, they need to discern between um, pests and predators. Um, the other day I got a phone call where somebody ID'd um, Western predatory mite as strips and they killed all those predators. So it's very important just to discern between those two. Secondly, we need to know the pest biology and the population ecology, the influence that environmental factors have on the pest population, and what effect that's going to have, specifically my agroecosystem, on the abiotic and biotic mortality factors. Is it gonna promote it? We need to monitor effectively on a very, very fine scale so that we make sure that we get the correct information in to use IPM as a decision support system in relation to detecting the species presence, how much is there of each of them, and how are they dispersed on my area, my farm, and my orchard level. And through that, I can use this monitoring data with modeling data to decide where am I going to do what. Use efficient monitoring strategies. This is very important. We need to find ways to effectively monitor so that we don't monitor too much. And there is very good systems in South Africa that we can implement to monitor. So we don't monitor too much, not too little, just the right, so we don't waste time specifically in the orchards. We need to collect and collate that specific data so that we know specifically what's going on in my farm. And so for example, in this graph, I'm just showing codling moth catches on the specific farm. You can, we can clearly see which of the orchards have an incidence level and which has not, and where our specific catches is. This will be the same, for example, for red spider mite. It's important to monitor the specific pest and its predators so that we know when to react and when not to react. For example, the, the chart on the left shows that we had to interact because the red spider mite levels was getting too high in relation to the, to the predator population. But in the left, on the low environmental stress orchard, no reaction was needed and we could move throughout the season without any sprays. And uh, this is just a graph in terms of showing that I'm collating each season and year to show that um, using a good monitoring approach, we could reduce our sprays each season dramatically throughout. My time is running out. Um, good modeling is very important. Use models that you can effectively use to tell you what to do when, where, and how. Um, this will be different. For example, this is a calling moth graph. I'm going to get to that one now. Um, the same with with, uh, for example, bollworm, you're not gonna possibly manage the population, but you're gonna manage the egg laying with degree days to determine, do I need to shorten my spray intervals or lengthen them specifically to stop them from, from uh, damaging fruit. So using all of this information, we can then implement it into a decision system where we identify orchards that have issues, use this together with our modeling data to implement certain strategies. For example, implementing mating disruption, chemical control, in the beginning of the season, the first generation, and then we don't have to spray for the rest of the season. This is great because then we spray less, it's less environmental impact, and we have a lower impact on our natural control systems. But let's say in orchards that have a high pressure, they will have to need to react to fight the problem out. And from there on, we're gonna spray throughout the whole season, and we realize that we need to implement a lot of other strategies to help and get that orchard clean. For example, regular sanitation, fruit thinning in bags, corrugated cardboard over, over the, um, the, the trees just to catch out a lot of those pupae. And there, we need to realize that we're going to have repercussions in terms of because we're spraying throughout the season, we're gonna get pest repercussions later in the season and that I need to control. But hopefully the next season is gonna be much better because I'm gonna spray less. In terms of chemical application, it's still the, the heart of the system because this is what we are based on and our orchards aren't there yet to get rid of it. So we just need to know that it forms an integral part of IPM. It's not a silver bullet. And we need to use strategies. Don't spray following a program. Use a strategy and control it through that. We should also appoint ourselves as stewards of active ingredients because of the rate that we're currently losing them. And of course, manage your product positioning. Make sure that you 
you place the product at the correct place to keep in the PHI, keep market access, and protect beneficials. It's only going to be effective as it's applied, because by hard to be all tight, but this is very important. It doesn't help you spray and you're doing it wrong. You're not going to get effectiveness out of it. And when we're taking into account specifically drift, this is a really bad image in our industry. We need to start many managing this because this is kind of defeats the purpose of IPM if you have a lot of drift and it's an environmental concern. So make sure you calibrate the system correctly and try to not look like that. So in conclusion, a best practice IPM should be a decision support system based on your agricultural ecosystem. It should focus on maintaining or improving your profitability, minimizing selection pressure, and maintaining environmental quality. Always start with trying to improve your agroecosystem's biodiversity because at the end this will improve IPM implementation. Focus on prevention and have a plan and a strategy. Monitor effectively and efficiently, only spray when it's where it's necessary, and control through implementing multiple um, techniques. Thank you very much.